All right. So uh, again, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be able to join. Uh, it looks like a, a really nice crowd in the audience and uh, excited to, to hear your thoughts on this project. So this is a project um, on both how we measure territorial control as well as the way that we can think about the origins of territorial control. So really excited to hear feedback, especially from those of you who work on where rebel groups come from. Um, and, and I wanna also highlight that this is a, this is a bit of a joint venture uh, what I'm going to be presenting to you here right now is, is a measurement exercise with an application, but it's part of a broader research agenda that involves uh, folks like Maria Ballesteros, who's, a, who's now a PhD student at Harvard, as well as Chris Blair, who will be uh, starting in the, the fall at Princeton. So as a, a, bit of a, a bit of a motivation, since this is a, a group of us that are interested in, in armed groups, uh, none of what I'm about to say will, will come as a surprise, but I think it's worth just briefly restating which is that territorial control, uh, the idea that a, an armed group, whether that armed group be the state or a rebel organization, the fact that it can contest and control a physical territory uh, matters during conflict. It's gonna influence the emergence of rebel organizations, whether or not it, for example, territorial control enables them to engage in tax collection, the provision of quasi-state functions, or the partial consolidation of political authority during an ongoing conflict. Um, it's also going to be the case that territorial control influences how these wars are fought. And so these small wars are often uh, contests over the control of a population, um, as well as the flow of information both to and from armed actors and civilians. Of course, beyond that, it's also going to influence, and this is where you know, I think especially the policy relevant side is, thinking about after conflict ends, what happens with reconstruction and development. And of course, these areas of control that are contested by insurgents during a war uh, can eventually become pockets of resistance, even if the state wins uh, a consolidated victory. But these might also be places that in the wake of a rebel-led victory uh, might be exposed to disproportionate political and economic transfers. Okay. And yet, despite the fact that territorial control is central to the way that we think about how uh, wars emerge, how those wars are fought, and what happens after a civil conflict ends, uh, it is perhaps the least well-measured concept in, in the field. And so the existing measures uh, in the field right now typically rely either on uh, present or historical measures of rebel activity, especially rebel violence, um, or expert assessments. And so the tricky part about relying on rebel uh, violence in order to measure where rebels have control um, is that usually that means that violence is going to be on both sides of the equation, since uh, in the end we typically are interested in studying the effects of control on the ability to produce violence. So violence on one side of the regression and violence on the other. Um, and it's also the case that in order to think about this relationship between violence and control, we either have to assume that control is linear or is very specifically nonlinear in particular kinds of violence. And this, again, requires making a series of uh, otherwise largely unfounded assumptions about the production of violence and its generalizability across conflicts. And so that's perhaps the reason why uh, reliance on violence as a historical measure of control is problematic, but it's also the case that uh, many of these studies focus on the use of expert assessments. Um, now, these also don't <laughs> come, with, come with a few drawbacks, which is usually that they're tied to a foreign military actor. They're subject to what we might think of as the political economy of data collection, right? When and where the data is collected, as well as when it's released. Um, it, there's, a, there's a political dynamic there as well. Um, it's also typically sensitive or classified or limited access, which means it's only going to be available for a small number of conflicts or a very small number uh, of, of individuals, especially scholars, can have access to them. Um, and more broadly, these kinds of exit assessments are going to be available for a very small number of, of conflict uh, conflicts throughout modern history, and they're going to be a non-random set of conflicts, right? So we might have concerns about generalizability. So uh, a bit about what, what I'm hoping that we'll have be able to talk about today um, and, and hopefully get your feedback on, which is I'm going to walk you through uh, an initial idea for a novel measure of territorial control that I think and my, my colleagues think have 
potentially very broad applications to the field beyond just the place where we're gonna study it. Well, I'm then gonna show you some preliminary evidence where we implement and we can validate this theoretical measure. And then I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about if we have time, uh, the economic origins of control. And in particular, we're gonna leverage something about the economic shocks that occur in Afghanistan that vary uh, both across years and across space, but their value is also gonna vary within year, which we can take advantage of. All right, so a little bit about uh, measuring control. And so just to, to take a step back, right, um, the state emerges in part because of its ability to collect and operationalize information on the civilian population. Right? So this is sort of the core notion behind legibility. The fact that the state can gather demographic details, uh, it can identify where taxable assets exist, and there's also an interest in being able to understand the attitudes and preferences of the subjects, of, of the governed. Right? Um, and information is central to modern state functions as well, especially the provision of public services. Uh, understanding civilian needs is going to be a core input to understanding where uh, those civilian projects need to be dedicated. And so this is true in general, but you can think that the role of information, uh, especially high quality information, is going to be heightened during civil conflict, where the state and its allies uh, are likely to invest very heavily in gathering information about civilian life, uh, patterns of movement, uh, as well as mapping the preferences of, of various authorities. And one type of authority uh, is, is the rebel side. Okay. And so the ability of governments to collect information itself is going to reflect state capacity. Um, and that's because the information that's collected is going to vary in quality. And that variation in quality can serve as an indicator of state capacity. And I think this is a series of really important work um, involving usually age heaping and census data, uh, folks like Suresh Naidu and Jesse Driscoll, as well as Melissa Lee and others, uh, have really been able to take advantage of what can we learn uh, from the quality of the data collected by the state. Um, and yet, this particular approach is actually a second stage outcome. So information quality is a second stage outcome, but the first stage is is at least equally important, but we think is potentially more important is can the state even collect information at all? And if it can't collect information, uh, why can't it? And both the ability to collect information in general, as well as the downstream quality of that information uh, is gonna vary with time and space. And, and that's what we're attempting to explore. And you might think that something like the, the ideal approach would be to think about high frequency attempts to collect information, something like a census. Um, but unfortunately, a census is usually collected in a manner that's not very high frequency, and they're actually least common in exactly the cases that we would want to study. And so think about cases that are fragile or weakly institutionalized context. Um, census collection is actually rather infrequent, uh, if it occurs at all. As an alternative, there are actually quite a few domestic and international agencies that contract with survey companies to conduct hundreds of subnationally representative field surveys each year. Um, and often those surveys are conducted in exactly the missing cases where uh, that census data doesn't exist. And so perhaps there's something that we can, we can learn from there. And the idea is that the sampling resampling design of the surveys is itself a data generating process, especially if you can think about metadata on failed enumeration as potentially providing you insights on pockets of inaccessibility. And so what this looks like is that there was an attempt to conduct a survey in a particular place, um, but it failed for any number of reasons. If you have metadata, both on the failure and why it occurred, you can potentially identify those pockets of inaccessibility. And so you know, to kind of walk you through uh, as a brief overview of what we talked about so far, you can imagine that regardless of what we study, whether or not it's census records or survey data, there's always an attempt to collect information. So there's always an enumeration attempt. And in the past, what folks have been focused on is on this first branch, which is that the sampling outcome was successful. So there was uh, the ability to collect information and then attempts to think about what can we learn conditional on sampling success from variation in the quality. So is the data high fidelity or low fidelity? That's what the existing approach has taken. What we suggest theoretically is that you can take advantage of information from the lack of signal 
uh, because of the failure of the enumeration event in general, right? And so, of course, there are many reasons why a failure could occur. It could be something like a failure of state capacity, like a lack of transportation. It could be something like the presence of other non-state actors that are largely irrelevant to territorial control, or it could be something like rebels' denial of entry to outsiders, okay? And so that's what we're gonna attempt to, to take advantage of. And so our particular application is, is going to be in Afghanistan, and we're gonna be focused on enumerability there. And so during the most recent conflict, uh, informations on civilians and their preferences were a backbone of military and political assessments. Uh, there was one firm in particular, which is Axor, uh, which was contracted by a number of both military and non-military agencies and organizations, uh, as well as uh, quite a few academics who work in Afghanistan, to conduct nearly continuous field-based survey data collection. And so their survey enumeration efforts ended up reaching more than a million survey respondents uh, from 2009 to 2020. And their collection of in-person data ended in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so uh, a few things about their sampling design. So they stratified by province and then they selected districts for enumeration proportional to population. To improve the efficiency of their operations, the firm actually collected and continuously updated a centralized database of enumerator access to all of Afghanistan's districts. So sampling uh, can fail for a number of reasons. As we talked about before, it could be a failure of state capacity because of weak transportation. It could be something having to do with local weather conditions. Uh, but most importantly, for thinking about trying to draw inferences about territorial control, there's denial of entry by a, an armed actor. And so it turns out that Axor both is classifying enumerability, but they break it down by subcodes. Uh, including whether or not the enumerators were denied access by the Taliban. And so what this ends up looking like is a district by month panel that tracks accessibility across the entire country uh, to enumerators and breaks down the accessibility, uh, in particular places that are inaccessible, why were they inaccessible? Uh, it breaks them down by subcodes, including specifically whether or not these outside actors were denied uh, access by by the Taliban. Austin, I'm so, sorry, can, but can I ask you to wrap up because uh, I, I tried to show you the, <laughs> this time. Oh, shoot, but yes, it didn't yeah. Work, so, sorry. Yeah, we're almost there, almost done. So, um, and so because of that, you know, one, one key thing is that we were granted access to this. And so what we can do uh, is we can tie um, that survey enumerability measure to a series of other expert based assessments, uh, including those that are currently classified. Uh, by, the, by the US military. And effectively, although there are these large differences, uh, gaps in the number of districts that are classified as under rebel control, there is actually a pretty substantial consistent trend uh, in the direction of shifts in control, especially after uh, the US withdrawal. And so hopefully at some point later on, we'll have an opportunity to talk about the economic origins of territorial control, but for now, it'd be tremendous to get your, to get your thoughts on, on the basic measurement concept. So thanks again. Uh, and, and looking forward to hearing your thoughts.